Let us pray. O God, who by the passing of Christ your Son, our Lord, abolished the death inherited from ancient sin by every succeeding generation, grant that just as being conformed to him, we have borne by the law of nature the image of the man of earth, so by the sanctification of grace we may bear the image of the man of heaven. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance, and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living, and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked, and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light and fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty. Because he surrendered himself to death, and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many, and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me 
Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. 
Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning. And they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled, so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the, the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king? Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head, and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, king of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And he said to them, Behold, the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid, and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him, so Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you, and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold, your king! They cried out, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription, because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, 
I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdalia. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side. And immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happens so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again another passage says, They will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. As Holy Week progresses, Jesus and the crowds grow more and more different from each other. One of the twelve betrays him while another denies him. Jesus dies on the cross, humiliated, alone, and jeered at. As we move through the events of the last days of Jesus, we can see within it the drama of every human life and the emotional suffering that so many of us experience. Now here we are in an empty church, live streaming the celebration of the Lord's passion and death to the faithful diaspora, isolated in their homes, looking and longing to assemble again to have hope in the midst of this darkness. We ask in the midst of all the suffering and tragedy, and perhaps now during these more difficult days, the question that Father J.M. reflected on on Palm Sunday, where is God? The answer is very clear. God is on the cross. God in the depth of compassion and love is crucified. Death by crucifixion was horrible, painful, and humiliating. It was not only a punishment for a criminal, but a sign of humiliation to his family and a warning to his disciples and followers. Jesus dies the death of criminals and revolutionaries in the Roman Empire. Instead of the cross being for us a sign of humiliation and embarrassment, we glory in the cross, for we see beyond it to the resurrection. The people at the time of Jesus 
could only see failure. In Jesus, we understand the meaning of love and suffering. As we suffer, it is God who suffers with us. And in the midst of that suffering, we carry in us the hope of the resurrection, which stands beyond the cross. God stands on the other side of the chasm of abandonment, waiting for us to transverse the divide. We have heard how St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, early in her ministry to the poor, often felt abandoned by God. And she was racked with emptiness and doubt. Some see in her doubt a scandal. Instead, this shows the depth of her relationship with God. In this way, she stands with the prophets, especially Jeremiah, and with other saints like Teresa of Avila, and certainly with Jesus himself. To be sure, each of us has that experience of abandonment and isolation in some way, whether profound or subtle. In those moments when we are feeling lost and abandoned, the cross makes the most sense. It was easy last Sunday to be with the crowds welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem, expecting the glory of the world. It is similarly easy to be with the crowds today condemning Jesus to death when those expectations are unrealized. The crowds may well have felt that Jesus had abandoned them. Certainly, they felt abandoned by their leaders, and perhaps some of them felt the same way about their relationship with God. Jesus, as he takes on the sins of us all and dies on the cross, experiences the abandonment that is common to the human experience of suffering and death. Today, an insidious virus and the actions of our national, state, and local governments can leave us feeling abandoned, perhaps abused, and maybe even left either to survive or to die alone. Yet this painful and discouraging experience for us serves as a paradox for the peace that comes with knowing that Jesus Christ suffered on our behalf so that we might live. We must not lose hope, for as Christians, we are at our very core a people of hope. When you feel the agony to rage, where is God in the midst of loss, suffering, or abandonment? Focus on the cross. It is there that any experience of death has its most profound meaning. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God. That our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her, and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty ever living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church spread throughout all the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the Pope, let us pray also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For all orders and degrees of the faithful, let us pray also for our Bishop David O'Connell, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our catechumens that 
our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus, our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, who made your church ever fruitful with due offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that we born in the font of baptism, may be added to the number of your adopted children, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the unity of Christians, let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased, as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the Jewish people, let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed on your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those who do not believe in Christ, let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty and living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world, through Christ our Lord. who do not believe in God. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right and sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you, and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those in public office, let us pray also for those in public office that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty and ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and the freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those in tribulation, let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners,
strength of all who toil. May the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for a swift end to the coronavirus pandemic that afflicts our world, that our God and Father will heal the sick, strengthen those who care for them, and help us all to persevere in faith. Almighty and merciful God, source of all life, health, and healing, look with compassion on our world, brought low by disease. Protect us in the midst of the great challenges that assail us, and in your fatherly providence grant recovery to the stricken, strength to those who care for them, and success to those working to eradicate this scourge through Christ our Lord. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the salvation of the world. O come, let us adore Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the salvation of the world. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. But 
deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and saved from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The kingdom, the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Christ our Lord. 